It's about the the double life of an Irish spy in wartime Berlin. And it is about that. Uh, and uh, it essentially follows uh, an Irish Republican IRA fighter, radical anti-Nazi who finds himself kind of doing the bidding of the Germans through strange historical circumstances. Uh, uh, but then actually, it's really a novel about w what happens when the thing that's supposed to happen doesn't happen. So uh, in this case, it would be the, the planned German invasion of Britain that was planned for 1940. That never happens. And so my uh, anti-Nazi Irishman finds himself cooling his heels <clears throat> in Nazi Berlin for the duration of the war. everyone, this is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books Podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I am really excited to have on the show Peter Mann talking about his new novel, The Torqued Man. Peter Mann is a PhD in modern European history and is a past recipient of the Whitting Fellowship. He teaches history and literature at Stanford and the University of San Francisco. He is also a graphic artist and cartoonist, and I checked out some of your some of your cartoons, Peter, and they're really cool. Oh, nice. And this is his debut novel. So, Peter, how are you doing today? Doing well. Doing well, AJ. How are you? I'm great. On the note of of your 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 cartoons that you've got, I went to your your website and you've got a ton of stuff up there. How much what's your output on these cartoons? How often are you are you drawing these? You know, I had a stint for about seven years from 2014 to 2021 where I did a weekly comic that was syndicated on a, a gocomics.com. So it made me have to produce every every Monday morning. Something had to come out of me. Uh, <laughs> Nothing like deadlines. Good. Yeah, I mean, nothing like a weekly deadline it was great. And then since that expired, I do them much more leisurely. But, Very but cool. yeah, the, the years and the weeks pile up. Now, did you do the cover art on your book? I did. Oh, that's yeah. really cool. I wondered. I hesitated to ask you in, in case the answer was no, you didn't. But that's really cool. Very nice. Yeah, it's come true. I didn't. Uh, I didn't expect. That. I just really didn't ask for it going in. But when they they, they uh, you know asked if I wanted to take a shot at it, I leaped at the opportunity oh that's really cool i uh, i interviewed a um a journalist an iraqi journalist a few weeks ago and i went through the whole book up until like our interview where he mentioned he was like an architecture guy and he does a lot of doodling and i connected the dots because in his book there were a lot of doodles around i was like did you draw those he's like yes i did that was cool. like oh that's very cool so cool uh so a very so a uh you're a very talented cartoonist as well as a novelist. Thanks. And we were talking before the show, your book is is right up my alley. Uh, it's so unique. It's so interesting. It's it's packed full of history, uh, World War II history, um, which is very interesting to me. So really nice job there. Maybe to, to get us started here, in your own words, what is your novel about? Oh, the toughest question. Uh, it's uh, the the short answer I give people is it's about the the double life of an Irish spy in wartime Berlin, and it is about that. Uh, and uh, it essentially follows uh, an Irish Republican IRA fighter, radical anti Nazi, who finds himself kind of doing the bidding of the Germans through strange historical circumstances, uh, uh, but then actually. It's really a novel about w what happens when the thing that's supposed to happen doesn't happen. So uh, in this case, it would be the, the planned German invasion of Britain that was planned for 1940. That never happens. And so my uh, anti-Nazi Irishman finds himself cooling his heels <clears throat> in Nazi Berlin for the duration of the war. And uh, it's, it's really about told from two perspectives, one from his German spy handler, who himself is a a, 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 a vexed in a vexed position in the sense that he also loathes the Nazis but finds himself working for them um, even more deeply complicit in them and it's account of, of his relationship with this charismatic Irishman Frank Pike and then the other narrative in the manuscripts are uh, is, is, is what 
we can maybe say is the voice of Frank Pike himself, although it's veiled in this kind of mythical, fictional, third-person narrative called Finn McCool in the Bowels of Teutonia. Finn McCool in the Bowels of Teutonia concerning his murderous exploits in Berlin. So it's this kind of larger-than-life uh, Celtic mythical veneer over whatever whatever our Irishman has actually been up to in the Reich during these years. Very cool. Well, I was going to ask this later on in the conversation, but since you brought it up, I'll, I'll ask now. Why did you choose to structure this story, just half as half of it as a journal and half as a novel manuscript? Uh, you know, I, I didn't set out that way. It, it's something about, I think, it's one of those things that kind of struck me while I was working out how I was going to tell this story. I think I, I knew I started with with the journal from the spy handler from a character, Adrian de Groot. And I had a sense of him as a character. Some of this was drawn from, from a journal, which is a really interesting journal by a guy named Friedrich Rieck, who is a, a, a deeply conservative, but anti-Nazi who wrote this kind of wartime uh, journal throughout the thirties and forties. Uh, and, and that put an idea in my head. Uh, and then Thomas Mann's novel, Dr. Faustus, which is uses this conceit of telling the life story of of, of a composer, but through f- from the perspective of his friend, and so I thought, oh, th- there'd be something interesting there in terms of uh, if, if my guy is telling his story, is telling the story about the Irish character Frank Pike, right through his own journal, looking back, and then, uh, I, and then the Frank Pike narrative, why it became this larger in life mythical thing, I think it's just part of it was I, I. I wanted to play with this idea of, of well, we can't really know, like keeping it veiled in mystery in terms of what this person is really doing. And so I think the cloak of fiction seemed right for how he would tell his story. But really this idea of the two dueling perspectives came to me when I was reading, I was reading through files in the UK National Archives. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here in the sense that I'm, I base this story off of uh, a real character. So my Irishman, Frank Pike, is, is very much based off of a real man named Frank Ryan, who, just like in the novel, was a IRA fighter Republican who went over to Spain to fight the fascists in the Civil War, got caught, got thrown in Franco's prison, ostensibly for life, until uh, who shows up in summer of 1940, but the Germans, German military intelligence and says, Hey, you know, we'll let you out of this horrible prison cell. If you come to Berlin, come work for us. And of course the plan was to send him back to Ireland and coordinate the Irish wing of this planned uh, German invasion of Britain, operation sea lion. uh, And it never happens. So, so anyways, I was reading the files about this, the interrogation actually of Frank Ryan's German spy handler. Uh, so these were interrogations done, I think, the fall of 1945 by British and American occupying authorities in Berlin. And uh, and so th- I think that's what put me on to the idea of, of telling the story through through the spy handler, who's they're basically pressing this guy for like, what was this guy Frank Ryan up to? What happened to him? W- what was he really doing? And, you know, he, he has his version of events. And I thought, oh, it'd be interesting to tell the other version of events that, that in some sense, you know, intersects with overlaps with, with the official story, but also departs from it wildly at certain parts. Yeah. And I felt like this was such a good story for, for that type of structure, because there is a lot of mystery that's, that's going on that, that, that kept my attention. Uh, it should be noted that Alan first blurbed your book. And if that were me, I would, I would think that was like the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah, because I love those. Uh, I love his books, and I love those types of stories. But you're right; like having having fiction, um, you know, having like a you know, these are two pieces of writing that the the story is being told through. I don't know if the academic term for this is metafiction. Is that maybe uh, maybe I think, not? I think that generally applies. Okay, yeah. One of those terms that can mean so many things. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I think that structure really added to the intrigue of the story because I thought, you know, as you're reading a story like this, you you kind of wonder. I I wondered as a reader, you know, what's true, what's false. Um, you bring up at points in the story how stories are often, um, you know, misleading. So that was a very cool cool way I thought to uh, to structure this book. 
going back to to some of the history. So, like you mentioned, that so your your two main characters, Adrian and Pike, although they go by several names throughout throughout the story, I'll probably just call them Adrian and, and Pike. That's good. So those are those are real people, and I I was actually really fortunate before reading your book. I interviewed a, a writer named Tom Dunkel, and he wrote a book called Black Knights in the White Orchestra, and it's all about the Abwehr. And oh, cool. Yeah, I even uh, lots of characters from his, and his was a nonfiction narrative. Uh, but even uh, Fabian von Schlabendorf uh, makes an appearance in your book. Yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about so your 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 main character Adrian. Let's let's start with Adrian, one of your main characters. Talk a little bit about the historical person that you based him off of, Kurt, I believe. And talk about the Abwehr and like what his job was and kind of like what the real person was doing in uh, in Berlin. Your your book takes place between 1943 and 1945, mostly. Talk a little bit about the history behind the the character who was Adrian. Sure. So yeah. So Adrian's journal starts in November of 1943, which is during some pretty severe bombing. Uh, British bombing of Berlin, lots of parts of the Western part of the city were totally obliterated. Uh, and then it, it goes, his journal, I think ends in May of 1944, but he's looking back, uh, recounting his relationship with Pike that starts as far back as the summer of 1940. So you're getting a good chunk of, of the war in Europe, summer 1940 to spring 1944. So, uh, the real person, yeah, his name was Kurt Haller. And again, I, I learned about this from the, those interrogation reports. And I think I, I was led to those based on reading a, a couple biographies of Frank Ryan. So I, I knew the, the, the basic setup uh, in terms of, you know, Frank Ryan was taken from Spain by the Abwehr, brought to Germany, made mention of this guy. And then I dug in more to him. And I don't think at least I didn't learn a great deal about Kurt Holler, but I got enough of a sense of him. He he was a PhD, I think, in philology, and uh, I, I kind of quickly like had enough of a historical sketch of this character that I then like departed. I didn't spend a lot of time trying to find out more details of Kurt Holler, but instead I filled him in kind of with my own imagination and a composite of other figures. I mentioned before. Thomas Mann's novel, Dr. Faustus, there is, there's something about the kind of the, the narrator there is uh Zarinus Zeitblom. And there's something about this kind of a uh, humanist, the conservative, but, but, but horrified by fascism. Uh, he's in living in Nazi Germany. He's a closeted gay man. Um, he is someone who he had lived in Weimar Berlin where sexuality could, could be out in the open and now he's had to bottle that back in. So he's he's uh, he's um, he's had to do his own kind of contortions uh, and uh, to, to, in order to stomach being able to to, to work for this regime. And, and it's he found himself kind of drawn in, kind of you know I think he never intended to become a, a working for military intelligence uh, under the Nazi regime. So he goes to to Spain to essentially translate he himself my character got a he, he himself is a, a literary translator he made a living scratched out a living in Weimar Berlin now real quick are you are you talking about the historical no, no, or are you talking no, about Adrian no, I'm getting into the, my okay. character cool yeah. well you know my next question for you okay. was going to be some of the differences between um the real person Kurt and your character Adrian so maybe this is a good segue to talk about Adrian and like what he's doing and his personality too, because I, I thought he was a very well formed character. But yeah, maybe this is a good a good time to segue into the fictional sure, Adrian. Yeah, the group. I think, yeah, I already kind of shaded in there because, like I said, I, I mean, beyond the, the kind of situational relationship, and then like here was this guy's spy handler who was keeping track of this Irishman in Berlin. Uh, I knew you know I knew the house he was living at on Nymphenbrugge Strasse, which is this same house used in the novel, uh, right on. Uh, what used to be called Hindenburg Park, which is now Wilmersdorf Folk Park. So, so I didn't know much beyond that, though. So then I started yeah, filling it in. So then uh, I, I had no idea, for example, what Kurt Holler's sexuality was. There wasn't a, a sexual dimension to the relationship that I knew of that didn't come out in the interrogation reports, at least. Um, but so much doesn't come out in those. So there's a lot to be filled in. 
um, which was part of the fun, right? I think if I think if I had like a fully fleshed historical portrait, then I'd feel like there's a little less room for me as a as a novelist. Uh, but whereas I think what was really enticing was that there was just of an, enough of a, a kind of skeleton that I could flesh it out with fiction, um, and yet and it was fun to plug into you know the elements of reality that I wanted to hew to. So yeah, so so the fictional character Adrian de Groot is a literary translator and finds himself in Spain in the early thirties, kind of right after the Nazis have started to, to assert their power. Hitler hasn't taken power yet, but they've become after 1930 become a real political force. You, you couldn't ignore them as a bunch of, you know, lunatic fringe anymore. So they were lunatic mainstream. And, uh, and so he, he runs off to Spain, which is after 1931 till 1936 is this kind of similar to the Weimar Republic? It's a, the Spanish Second Republic. It's this kind of uh, renaissance of uh, modernization, uh, re- Republican thinking, flourishing of arts and culture, um, and then of course a lot of similar to Weimar, a lot of political polarization uh, by by the you know nineteen thirty four street violence, assassinations, uh, the rise of of, of of fascist movement. So. He gets sucked into the Spanish Civil War and finds himself working, doing kind of translation work for uh, a, a, a you know semi shadowy employer. It turns out it's the Obver, and 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 then by the time the war is in, in full effect, he's you know doing real spy work, forging documents, uh, keeping tabs on on enemy nationals. Uh, so that by the time 1940 rolls around, he's kind of old hand at this, but still still doesn't never really thinks of himself as never really thinks of himself as as a spy and everything himself as a nazi and, and a lot of the people in the obver in german military intelligence were were, were were either you know indifferent hostily indifferent to the nazis or outright opposed to them which ends up playing a role in terms of later assassination efforts but like yeah, i think william canaris who is in your book he right. was actually like he he plotted against hitler and he led the whole Obvious, or it, uh, if I might be misremembering that, but I, he was not a, a fan of Hitler. I, I know that. No, right, but he, you know, he still spent a, a lot of time uh, working on his war efforts. Like it was this it, interesting dance that he did of of uh, of kind of subtle undermining while also working toward Hitler's war aims at the same time and choosing opportune moments. And so that that sense of like complicity of kind of like telling yourself one story of like well I'm not really you know I'm not I don't really believe in this in fact I hate this I'm, I'm doing but I'm just doing this because it's my job and that that really appealed to me as a not as in the sense of like that's an ethically appealing way to live sure. but right it just it, it resonated with me of like that it is really it is really interesting to be I've always found uh, like this this structure you know I'm not a military historian. I've always found the the structure of intelligence during World War II in Nazi Germany like a very fascinating topic because of what you're just talking about. Like they're not like the Abwehr is not like packed full of Nazis. You know, maybe some of them have Nazi sympathies. A lot of them are kind of opposed to to the regime, and so it does make this like weird, you know, like the 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 ends, you know, the aims of these people are just doing their job, but like it is helping, helping this further this war effort that the Nazis have started. And it is like a very kind of interesting uh, topic to explore when it comes to morality and why people are doing what they're doing. Yeah, there's a lot of odd bedfellows in the <laughs> intelligence world. I mean, not just the obvious, but I think that's what makes it so fascinating, especially from a literary point of view, right? Is I think, and I think, you know, Alan first does a great job of, of exploring this through his fiction is how people who would otherwise right in times of, of war, not get like people who kind of intellectuals who might become, you know, professors instead find themselves sucked into espionage or maybe are, are professors and, and sucked into espionage, but it's, it, 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 you find types like doing, doing the work of war that are people who do not resemble soldiers at all. Yeah, well, you know, one of the one of the elements that you've explored in your book that I found this was like and even in history I find that this is like this is such like an extreme is is medicine and doctors and 
Well, talk talk a little bit about in your book. I know we're veering away from from Adrian, but we're just going to do it for a second because I want to stay on this thread. Uh, talk a little bit about the role that that doctors play in your book and and how you how you portray them in this story. Yeah, uh, they don't come off in the best light in this book. No, nothing against doctors per se, but uh, you know, the, uh, Nazi doctors uh, uh, were into some some pretty heinous stuff, and it's interesting. I mean, the like. It's not, you can think about the horrors of, say, like a Josef Mengele, right, and the experiments conducted by him at Auschwitz. And, but, uh, but I think that the role of medicine and the medical profession is actually even more deeply enmeshed than, than even just those kind of horrific cases in the sense that Nazism was a <clears throat> this kind of biomedical ideology, right, of, of cleansing the racial body of the German folk and, uh, that that wasn't just rhetoric in the sense that I think doctors as a profession had one of the highest memberships in Nazi party. The is that right? I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Um, That's crazy. There's a really interesting book called The Nazi Doctors by Robert J. Lifton, who's a psychiatrist, but who then veered into a lot of you know, history, studied brainwashing in Maoist China. I studied that uh, wrote the Nazi doctors. And there's been a lot of interesting work uh, on it since, but um, so so the 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 one one of the ways that doctors were so enmeshed, I think, in the the murderous policies of the Nazis leading up to the Holocaust. Bef- this is before war uh, and and the Holocaust was in this euthanasia program. It was it was called the T four, or in hindsight called the T four euthanasia program, operated out of Tiergartenstrasse four, so that became the kind of code name for it, and uh, it was uh, it kind of defies belief. Except you also then see like well, what comes after it. You realize that there's this this process of of kind of gradual escalation up to the systematic state killing uh, of, of you know people's deemed undesirable. And the euthanasia program was a, a domestic program that where doctors and nurses were uh, involved in basically putting out feelers and, and 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 sterilizing started with mass sterilization sterilizing anyone who oh had hereditary illness or development uh, you know mental mentally handicapped or physically disabled uh, people with epilepsy uh, people with cerebral palsy any of those people were, were sterilized and then it ratches it up. The euthanasia program then takes it to the next level. And they actually started calling for people, uh, you know, bringing their children to the hospital, people suffering from debilitating, let's say cerebral palsy is the, the one that, that uh, appears in, in my book, bringing sick kids to, or disabled kids to the hospital for quote treatment. And, uh, and then a couple weeks later returning, uh, an urn to them of their ashes. Uh, this was, it, it was done with some level of deception in the sense they'd say often that the cause of death was pneumonia or an infection, but it was, they were killing, uh, children. They were killing and they were killing German children within domestic, right? This didn't have to do necessarily, um, had nothing to do essentially with racism, but the same kind of logic of, uh, the phrase they used was, this was like their technical phrase was life unworthy of life. And so all these people uh, uh, were were purged from the racial body, uh, and yeah, so so you know, thousands of doctors and nurses and hospitals were complicit in this. That's so crazy because you think of medicine, uh, like the profession itself. You know, so you're you're supposed to help people, uh, of course, and to hear a, a statistic like doctors in Nazi Germany had one of the highest you know membership rates in the Nazi Party. That's very like that's that's just such an interesting I mean one it's very sad but just like you know you just think about like what what would make somebody who has has professed to be um this this person who will only help people what makes them you know subscribe to this type of ideology Yeah I think part yeah. of it is like a little rhetorical sleight of hand that that you know people thought instead of like healing the individual body that if you you go well I'm healing the collective body it's still 
and and it's that racial body that is the most important one. And so it's that that little switch of thinking that people still could tell themselves, "I'm still doing the work of medicine. I'm still engaged in healing." Yeah. Well, both of your characters, both Adrian and Pike, uh, neither of them like doctors. <laughs> Pike, uh, I believe, like he he sees like doctors abusing people in a Spanish prison, and I think he actually is a victim of some of that abuse himself. But let's actually let's let's talk about Pike. Um, we talked about Adrian. So first, similarly, how is Pike different from the historical Frank Ryan? And then just talk about Pike, the character who is is the spy in this story. Sure. Talk about the character. Well, just like following on our, our, our last subject there, just to tie it together. So you, you mentioned, yeah, F- Frank Pike, the character undergoes uh, uh, torture essentially at the hands of doctors in his Spanish prison, which is based on, again, a real historical event that I, I'm tr- I can't recall anymore whether Frank Ryan, the real historical figure himself, would have been a victim of this, but people very much like him. A lot of people from the International Brigades uh, and other Irish fighters specifically, I know, were, they, they did systematic studies on them, the, the, the prisoners that Franco's forces captured. They, they studied them it, in order to prove this theory that was a, a, a kind of brainchild of Spanish fascist, Spanish fascist medicine with the help of, of Nazi medicine, uh, which was this idea that Marxism was not just a, an ideology that people could believe in that, you know, be, become dangerous political forces as far as they were concerned, but that it was actually a, a, a disease of the mind that one could inherit and you could be like, a, you could have like, you could be a congenital Marxist. So they were doing all of these, you know, cranial measure, measurements, mapping batteries of tests to determine whether people were, were congenital Marxists. And this was done on, on, on international brigade prisoners. So Frank Ryan was a uh, was uh, like I said, yeah, an, uh, an IRA fighter. He had fallen out um, with the IRA itself. Became kind of riven by factionalism as as far back as uh, you know the Irish Civil War in, in the early twenties. But uh, but it, into the thirties, they kind of split into a left wing faction and a right wing faction. And Frank Ryan felt himself on, on the left. Uh, and and so found himself kind of out of the good graces there after 1934, but but then went off to Spain to to fight. The real Frank Ryan led, I think it was called the the Connolly Brigade, a group of Irish fighters in Spain. He found himself I think quickly doing more propaganda work, uh, and then he was at the front a bit, but uh, but found himself kind of you know be, behind the lines doing a lot of the the word work, the rhetorical work of the war, and uh, and was captured in 1937 uh, at Gandesa um, by Italian troops, and was he was originally sentenced to death by Franco by by a Franco's tribunal, uh, but then they commuted a sentence, and he he I think they commuted a sentence too because I believe if I have this right, everything's becoming hazier now that I work on a different book project, and this one recedes from memory, but. Edmund de, de Valera was the the prime minister of Ireland uh, at the time uh, and would be for a long time. But he, I believe, he recognized Franco's government at some point that toward the end of the war, and so that got Frank Ryan switched from death sentence to just life in prison. Um, and he he became Frank Ryan, Franco is one of his most kind of valued, famous prisoners. He was something of a, a personage. And then he and then so as far as the historical record you know, is concerned, like if you were living and reading the newspaper in Ireland, right, or, or anywhere, and you would wonder, like, around 1940, like, whatever happened to Frank Ryan? Like, he went to Spain, and we know that he got in prison, but the, 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 is that is he still there? What happened to him? So it's kind of this mystery. I think and people spent um, a couple of decades, I think, yeah, some time after the war, unraveling the puzzle of, of, you know, whatever happened to Frank Ryan during the war. There were these rumors that he, he had gone to, uh, to Germany, but they couldn't believe it. Right. Frank Ryan become a Nazi. That doesn't seem right. There, there were, there were plenty of, of other IRA figures who, who did, um, he wasn't the only one who, who, who ended up, you know, kind of joining forces with the Germans. Um, there were other people who were far more gung ho 
who it wasn't it wasn't much ideological contortion to join forces. People like Sean Russell, um, who figures briefly in the book, is a real historical character and was a kind of nemesis to to Frank Ryan. <clears throat> so the the real Frank Ryan and the real Fr- Sean Russell were sent in, in the sometime in the summer, late summer of 1940, I believe, were sent by a German U-boat back to Ireland, and they made it as far as the Bay of Galway, uh, just, uh, you know, some, I don't know, handful of miles off the Irish coast where they were supposed to, the plan was to deposit them there. They were going to coordinate forces uh, of the IRA, kind of both wings, you know, unite the clans, and then, uh, and then you know, look for that. I think there's something so ridiculous as, like, look for the flower pot in the window at the German embassy in Dublin, and that's the sign that the, the invasion of Britain is underway. So they get as far as the Bay of Galway, and Sean Russell dies somewhat mysteriously, though people likely think out of a perforated ulcer. His stomach ruptures, and he bleeds to death, and uh, and and they turn around um, because of this to try to get him medical help and disaster, and 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 so Frank Ryan, I don't know, you know, how much of the choice to turn around really is up to him in terms of historically, but he, the result is he finds himself back in Berlin and where he remains in the rest of the war. Like that was as close as he got to, to going home. And of course this planned invasion keeps on getting postponed, you know, by the fall of 1940, the RAF dominates the the skies. Uh, so like the, the, this invasion keeps on getting put back until eventually it's completely off the table. Once they invade Russia, things have just totally changed. And so now he's cool in his heels. Uh, and then the real Frank Ryan, I think dies a uh, fairly, you know, ignominious, uneventful death uh, of, of of various illnesses. I think like liver failure sometime in 1944 in Dresden, if I recall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I took a, a lot of the, the external events and, and there was something about Frank Ryan too, that for, from, from by all accounts, he seems to have been a kind of gregarious, you know, charming figure, but someone who's, who's both like a, adept at, you know, orating, but it was a, a former like, street brawler. Uh, is originally from Limerick, um, and and then you know spent a fair time in, in Dublin. So he's in the Bronx probably, too, right? Your character yeah. was yeah in the Bronx or a bit. I live in the Bronx for a while, so yeah. that stuck out to me. Okay, you know I can't. I don't think the real Frank Ryan lived in the Bronx. I think. Okay, well I'm glad that that made it that made it into your book at least. <laughs> yeah. It was so it was fun to kind of mash up you know other plausible histories into this real one. Yeah, so so I you know he's he was such an interesting figure and like when I when I first read about I think I I first came across the historical figure of Frank Ryan just reading about the Spanish Civil War you know as a, like I had got my I still teach in history and literature and so I was I, I came in a lot of this stuff I think I like done a lot of reading about you know, interwar Europe, wartime Europe, the Spanish Civil War. And Frank Ryan was just this figure that kind of popped in my mind. I was like, oh, it sounds like an interesting guy, right? Uh, it sounds like a, an interesting fraught position. And I just kind of like tucked it away in the back of my brain for a while and uh, kept thinking like, is there a way I could do some sort of historical project about him? But that n- nothing really struck me. But what, what struck me was that there was such an opening for fiction because of, uh, of again, like I said, like, the gaps in terms of we know a lot, but we also don't know a lot about, you know, what he was doing or what was, there's some letters from him in Berlin, but just thinking about that kind of fraught contorted mindset one must have. I think he probably just slowly drank himself into oblivion, which is one strategy, but I thought that like interesting to imagine another one. Yeah. Yeah. I read that in your acknowledgement section that you're like, this was just going to be a better novel than it was going to be like a history. And I thought that was so cool. Yeah. Thanks. So talk about the the relationship between the two of them. Yeah, they have it. They have a complicated relationship. So Pike is, so Adrian's essentially a closeted gay man who's, you know, he's had like gone, he's, he's gone to ground in terms of his sexuality. It's completely under wraps uh, as far as he's concerned, because it's of course, you know, potentially lethal for, for that to, to get out. Whereas Frank Pike is this pansexual of larger than life character, especially Frank Pike, as he appears in, in Finn McCool, that his, his own manuscript is his kind of alter ego is even more larger than life pansexual. But but even even Adrian's portrayal of, of of Frank Pike in a more down to earth, 
telling is um, is someone who <clears throat> who's bisexual and who who leverages kind of his his charm and his charisma and his sex appeal to to uh, Adrian kind of in his thrall very quickly. And Adrian starts to kind of be aware of this. So there's in some sense, there's this tale of there's their on again, off again, romantic relationship, but that's then, you know, laid over this, I guess we could say workplace relationship of spy and spy handler and a genuine friendship. But there's, there's, you know, these shifting power dynamics in terms of how much Adrian senses he's feeling, he's being manipulated by Pike how much of his attention right is there to get something he wants and then and then kind of dissipates as soon as pike has gotten what he needed from him so so the relationship is so it's a, it's a it's a story of, of of genuine friendship but with these other dynamics both the 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 sexual and the political that that are, are kind of the ever shifting sands between them no but you didn't it, there was no uh, historical evidence that this 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 relationship that either their sexualities were uh, either bisexual or, or homosexual this was just part of the novel no yeah it's just part of the novel it's just something that and it was not something i set out to say oh i know i'll change them and, and make them gay it's it's just something that, that it kind of evolved in the writing of it in the relationship that kind of at first took me by surprise and then fell right into place and, and opened up a lot of interesting things to explore between them also, Can I ask you? I'll just say one more thing. It was yeah. it, it, it unlocked, I think, that sense that a window back into the Weimar era, which right in, in which the kind of sexual liberation and gay culture played such a, a prominent part. And so there was that sense of then of the contrast of of what gets re- so brutally repressed and locked away under the Nazi regime, which also I think contributes to that sense of 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 the the contorted or torched nature of, of of people both both in terms of their politics and their sexuality of that that the people have to perform under such a, a repressive regime and now is that is is that part of why you have called this book the torqued man that's part of it yeah all right what's yeah. the other part there's a lot of things that all kind of came together in the sense that the that that phrase the torqued man came out of a uh, a, a translation of a ancient Irish epic called the Toyn, which is about this. Basically, it's this this amazing story of this uh, one one man, you know, battle royale, uh, one man stand against these these armies of Ulster, Cuchulain, this young hero, young teenage Irish hero who who kills thousands of men in battle, and it's just this you know very important irish epic and so there's a a translation uh, i believe his name is carson colors if i'm might be mixing up my carsons anyways this english translation where he he translates uh the this process that the the hero undergoes when he uh, he gets into a battle frenzy Similar to like the you know the berserker Vikings that uh, you know may or may not have been eating hallucinogenic mushrooms or drinking strong mead, but they go into this frenzy, right? And, the, and, and this kind of shape shifting quality, and they become something different. Well, in in the Toyn, there's this incredible, these incredible passages where the the hero undergoes the torquing, as he calls it, and uh, and he undergoes this kind of reconfiguration of his parts, and so you know his his, his mouth and his skeleton all get rearranged and he then becomes this like you know this sheer ball of terror that wreaks hell so 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 it was that phrase of of uh, of the torquing and the torqued man which i think the translator borrows from a an ancient roman general uh who who i think uh trying to remember i think he there's there's a story in the footnote there that I'm dimly recalling about a, a Roman general who's wearing a torque, right? There's also another meaning of that word is is this uh, piece of armor, right? You wear around your neck, and uh, and I think one of the, there's like a a battle kind of mano a mano combat where a, a Roman general and and one of these you know wild Celts face off against one another, and uh, the Celts. Uh, uh, I think the the Roman general runs, stabs 
the Celt and takes his torque and wears it and is there. And after that, he's known as Torquatus. And there's a, a, a famous general called Torquatus. And so this idea of the torqued man or the torqued one, just that was such an evocative phrase. And then I, I, I could repurpose it to use it for this idea of kind of intellectual, sexual, emotional contortions that one has to undergo in the Nazi period. Uh, and then it mashed up well with my, the, the whole Celtic theme that's, that's told in the Finn McCool manuscript. That's so fascinating. Uh, you know, one of the things that when I was reading this, so I read that, that you have a PhD in European history. And as I was reading it, I was trying to think, I was like, all right, what's Peter like? What's his specialty? Like, you know, is he an expert on Spain? Like, is he an expert on Germany? Yeah, like, no one knows. I don't know myself. <laughs> <laughs> what type of what kind of type of stuff do you teach? So I, my, that doesn't really answer your question either. So <laughs> I teach in a, a humanities program. It's called the Master's Program of Liberal Arts at Stanford, and it's it's an interdisciplinary humanities program for 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 people who want to come back and in and. and uh, study this stuff and get a, a, a master's, whether it's in history, you know, studying history, studying literature, studying art, or, or, you know, combining them to some effect. But they come back later in life, typically. So my students are somewhere between 25 and 75. And, and so I, I, I love it because I don't actually teach in a traditional academic field or specialty. So my own training is in history, but my, my degree is technically as a joint PhD in history and humanities. So I was always reaching for, for something beyond. I think what, I, what drew me to history itself as a discipline in the first place is simply that it's a discipline that can accommodate so much. You can study literature, you can study philosophy, you can study military history, you can, you know, under the guise of, of cultural history, you can study just about anything as long as it already happened. And so I've always been a, a generalist and interested in kind of cross-disciplinary stuff and just uh, have resisted specialization. But I found myself at the end of grad school studying more German, Spanish, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, my focus was more on intellectual history. So I wrote a dissertation on, on, on the German writer Thomas Mann and the Spanish philosopher Ortega Gasset. But I've always been interested in, in more than that, and like, in, you know, in sense of like grounding these ideas in the political and cultural landscape. But I think there was, I think part of the reason I was drawn to fiction is because I think the, you know, the novelist tool bag, like it's a, it's a grab bag. You can use like whatever comes to hand, whatever is of interest, whatever fits together well. There's something more, I think, col like in, in kind of collage work that, that can come in in fiction writing. Which, uh, which, which still like studying history comes in really handy. And, and, and I still feel like that's, you know, I spent a lot of my time doing is reading about the past, but now it's like with an eye to, to figuring out how to kind of recombine things to, uh, to create a, a compelling, illuminating story. And so, so I, the, the program I teach in, I get to teach a year of, of just essentially 4,000 years of history that involves maybe a quarter of the, or a quarter through a third of the world. I start with Gilgamesh and we work our way uh, slowly and erratically and haphazardly uh, over 30 weeks till we get to the present and 21st century fiction. So. Oh, that's so cool. I, uh, when I was reading, like, I, I really got the sense that, that you were very well versed in a lot of the literature of Europe and you talked about intellectual history. I was, I was, I was very interested in like, what, you know, what is it that like makes Peter tick when I was reading your book? Um, so that's cool. And that, that makes sense. Well, what are, you know, what are like, what are some of the, uh, what are some of the other themes that, that you wrote about in this book that were just super interesting to you that, that you wanted to get out there? Well, there's, I mean, so yeah, I was by no means an expert in the, the Irish myth stuff, but that was really fun to, to, you know, it's something I'd read the toy years ago and then, and then dig into more. And then I, I also have a love of, of Irish modernist literature. So there's a great book that I will fully admit to, to having, you know, stolen uh, or artfully borrowed, maybe some of some of the the language. Um, it's called it's called At Swim Two Birds by Flan O'Brien, which 
in which this mythical figure, this legendary figure of, of, of Irish myth called Finn McCool also figures in. I mean, he, he himself is a, a you know, a, a standing figure of, of the Irish world of myth, but Flannel O'Brien repurposes him to, to telling this story about, uh, a, he has a character in this novel who's trying to write stories. And one of his characters is Finn McCool, but he's, he's, uh, kind of using this like mock heroic language to talk about more mundane 20th century circumstances or, or for example, he talks about Finn McCool, like having a, a back as, as broad as six handball courts and things like this. And so I, I knew that that was, I saw kind of a way in for the way Frank Pike would tell his story was he would adopt the alter ego of the mythical hero, Finn McCool. And he would use a similarly kind of mock heroic language. Um, so I had a lot of fun doing that. I'm not sure that's necessarily a theme, but that maybe the, the Irish dimension. Another thing that maybe ties into this theme of, of the Nazi doctors that we didn't talk about yet, but which is a lot of fun for me, was one of these, you know, these historical gems of, of craziness that I was happy to find a, a place for in the book and kind of serves as something of my MacGuffin, I suppose, is is this figure of, of Dr. Theodore Morell, who was Hitler's personal physician. Again, a real, yeah, a real historical figure. And there was an interesting book a number of years ago by Norman Oler called uh, Blitzed. And it's all about drugs. Like drugs, it, right? right? Yeah. yeah. I remember the cover. It's like the, it's like a, 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 this big, like neon green cover. And some guy's eyes are like kaleidoscopes. That's right. Yeah. 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 It's a cool little book in the sense of it, it, it does a couple things. One of them, is talks about just how ubiquitous high powered pharmaceuticals were throughout Nazi Germany and, and, and like literally fueled the war effort. Like the Blitzkrieg was possible only with massive, systematically administered doses of amphetamines to the soldiers. But just that this kind of, you know, you know, completely glutted high powered pharmaceutical drug culture, much similar to our own, was was, you know, just part of the texture of everyday life under the Nazi regime. Uh, but the, the other component of this book is, is, is this strange character of Hitler's doctor who he would give Hitler all sorts of different in hormone injections. Um, and, uh, and, and, and these kind of like hormonal supplements were another kind of popular feature on the landscape, which also I think it was, was fun to explore thinking about kind of, you know, resonances. I think, you know, part of the appeal of, historical fiction is you're trying to say something about the contemporary world, but in a refracted indirect kind of way. So the way things resonate. So something that's not our world looks like our world that, and, and that to me is like what, what's fun. So, or, or what makes it compelling. And so I could, you could see in Nazi Germany kind of the roots of, of contemporary wellness culture. Which you know you don't think you don't like to think of those two together, or maybe I like to think of the two together, the the dark roots of of wellness. Theodore Morell, not only was he giving Hitler all sorts of 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 his own hormone concoctions, but he created this whole industry, developed his his own company called the Hama Industries, that were quite literally the fruits from the German campaign in the east, and so like basically from the Ukrainian plains, they would harvest the you know slaughter livestock and and harvest their various glands in order to create these hormone concoctions from you know sheep vulva and bull scrotums and and uh and so morel was shooting this up into hitler but he was also in selling this in all sorts of different forms he also had like a vitamin bar called the vitamult bar that 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 plays a, a, a minor role in the novel so that was really fun to 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 kind of weave into the texture of everyday life but then also have morel as as kind of this this kind of golden goose you know the ultimate nazi doctor that that finn mccool is at least gunning for i didn't realize in the book that that those part those animal parts were in i thought I, people talk characters in your book talk about um like bull scrotum i think it's like donkey scrotum or something like being in 
those vitamins, but I didn't realize that is a real historical thing that actually happened. Yeah, they at least they were in like the hormonal injections, and you know all sorts of like you know movie stars like the Ufa film stars and all people like high level high level members of uh, you know of Hitler's cabinet. They're all getting these injections, lining up to to get from Morel. I don't think that the vitamin bars himself had the the hormones in them, but I think yeah, I think our character just says they taste up like ground ground up donkey dick, which <laughs> man. Yeah, maybe there was a little bit in there. Was there, I don't know if you know this, but is, were any of those, was, is there really still anything that, did the wellness industry take anything from the Nazis? Did they actually advance that science at all? Well, you know, I mean, there's, there's something <coughs> that predates the Nazis. It doesn't necessarily start with them, but it is certainly a continuous cultural historical strand. Like starts, it starts really at the turn of the century. It's kind of in, in German, it's called Lebensreform. And it's this idea of like this life reform movement that, you know, you see um, sunbathing and vegetarianism and, and and hiking. Of course, like maybe people have gone hiking before, although that, that is a pursuit itself doesn't really predate the 19th century. It's like a, you know, pastime. You don't leave the city to go out hiking in the wilderness. But the idea that like this is all for you do all these things for a sense of well being and physical health. This idea of like of health as the supreme value, which is something that undergirds the the you know the murderous Nazi biomedical regime, right? Is everything is in the name of health, um, including like killing undesirable people. So so it all kind of is, is of a piece. Um, and so the, the Nazis didn't start that logic, but they they adopted it. They that, that becomes part of their ethos. Um, this kind of um, you know extreme wellness regime. Uh, they I, I think it was under the Nazis that they decaffeinated coffee. You know, another oh, hideous okay. crime. Yeah, <laughs> chop that up <laughs> to the tally of, of horrendous deeds. Um, but uh, this was done in the in the name of, of you know of, of health. Of course, they 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 at the same time they're like, we'll take the caffeine out of coffee, but we'll give you much more powerful amphetamines, way more powerful than caffeine that you could also drink down with your decaffeinated coffee. It's crazy. Um, well, what what are you hoping that when when somebody reads your book, what are you what are you hoping that readers take away? Oh man, that's a tough question. Yeah, I. I I don't want this to sound glib. I don't mean in a superficial way, but I mean, my ultimate aim is, is to entertain. Like I, I, I want them to be captivated. I want them to, to just be caught up in a story, but I want them to be caught up in a story. I suppose that, that seems like it's revealing something about this, the world that it portrays that they, they, they didn't know that takes them by surprise. Um, so that history appears in a slightly different light to them. But, but and then maybe in turn, their own world, their own sense of how they orient themselves in the present, right, in relation to the past, now feels a little different. So, yeah, some some sort of salutary estrangement, I guess, would be the ultimate goal, while while being really delighted. Very cool. Well, Peter, this has been a fantastic interview. Like I said, I was so fascinated by your book, and uh, I, it was a real joy to read. What are you working on next? You mentioned that you're on a different book project. What are you working on? I am. Yeah, I'm working on a another novel that has an espionage dimension, and it is also it's set in the early days of World War II, 1939, 1940. But the, the war is um, well, it's still there, but it's 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 slightly more adjacent in the sense that most of my story takes place in San Francisco, so America is not yet at war. And it really concerns the the disappearance of a of a celebrity writer adventurer, who's again similar to the way my, my, I, I drew a story around the real character of Frank Ryan. There is this real adventure uh, writer named Richard Halliburton, who was a really popular writer in the twenties and thirties, and became. Is he related to the oil the oil no, family? Not that I no. not that I know of. No, I don't think so. But he, uh, yeah. So I've changed his name to get rid of all those associations. But he, uh, he was one of these guys who wrote kind of like these boys' life adventures types, and uh, and 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 then his his last big kind of gimmick, his last big adventure to try to stay relevant was in 1939. He tried to sail a a traditional Chinese junk from Hong Kong to San Francisco, where he was supposed to arrive 
and be, you know, feted by the the World's Fair in San Francisco and Treasure Island. And uh, of course, it didn't work out that way. He disappeared at sea, and no one ever heard from him again. So I'm I'm exploring similar to Frank Ryan. I was like, well, whatever happened to uh, that kind of figure, and what kind of stories can we tell around that man's disappearance? Wow. Well, if he makes it into the war, I hope you'll come back on this podcast and uh, talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Or maybe that's not the way you're going. There's enough war in there. I could justify doing that. Okay, back. that's great. It only has to be war related. Yes, yeah. for for this show. Well, Peter, if people want to uh, follow you, follow your work, are you on social media? How can people find you? Uh, I do uh, Instagram occasionally. Uh, I have an account there. It's P Man Instantgrams. Uh, not the the most readily typable account, but uh, but I, maybe the best one stop shopping is just go to petermanbooks.com and uh, that links to various things, including my art website. If you want to see some different history literature related comics. Yeah. And I would, again, I would recommend everybody out there to check out some of Peter's other art because it is, it is really cool. Well, Peter, man, the torqued man, go buy a coffee, go check it out from your library. What an interesting story. And Peter, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks a lot, AJ. It's been a pleasure.